moving, so that's good. Definitely, uh, everybody needs to clamp down on their overall movement on the board because of worm sign. Down over here, we have, uh, yeah, there's just a whole bunch of worm attacks taking down a number of those flak trikes. And Gammon is producing some tanks, but he needs to be careful that they get airlifted from wherever they, they are produced from. See, that one's walking over the sand now. Uh, he did select it and choose airlift orders and told him to go over here. He did that on purpose, and he really needs to do that one too. That one's going to get eaten. So, again, you just got to be careful where you put your cues. Uh, there's another one rolling around. Worm sign, he stopped it immediately. So he's paying attention. And uh, Pruxy over here is just branching and branching and branching. He's already got the microwave power upgrade. I can see that. He's uh, He is a big fan of tech from the from the House of Ix. Uh, he, he's going to lose a carryall or two here. Probably needs to watch those a little closer. He, he's got kind of an issue here during a worm sign because all of his harvesters are down here, but his high-tech factory is up here. So it's going to take each carryall a few seconds to get down there and pick up a harvester. Ooh, that one just got eaten. Unfortunately, it was really close to uh, to a refinery, so the the carry all didn't uh, didn't assess that it was really needed to pick that one up. And there goes another one. So this is just uh, unfortunately this is a management situation here that just doesn't work out that well because these worms are all able to grab carry alls to, to grab harvesters before they get off of the sand. And his carryalls are too far away, really, to support them. They, they can't get there in time. That's simply the problem. So on the other side, Gavin already has a palace up. He's going to go for an alliance. He's going to take an alliance either with uh, House Corino, with the Spacing Guild, or with the Fremen. So we'll see what he decides on. And uh, if he's the Fremen, he'll be able to avoid a lot of worm sign and use Fremen warriors. If he is House Corino, he'll be able to use Sardaukar and buy some Death Hand launchers. If he is... Uh, if he allies with the Spacing Guild, he'll get major discounts at the Starport, and he'll also be able to use Saboteurs, which don't really work anything like they did in the original game, but they're very interesting. Now, here is a bit of a mistake. We've got a quad that's just going to die for no reason against a lot of light vehicles. Uh, but he did airlift away. He, um, he really could have just uh, retreated them. That probably would have been better. Um, than, than risking some of his carryalls, and especially since when units are put on airlift orders, they just sit there and wait to get picked up. So, um, you know, sometimes it's good to know. I, he wouldn't want it to give them move orders because then they would have taken extra damage because that's how my game works. And if he gave them attack orders, they would have tried to defend themselves too much. So really, I would have recommended in a situation like that, just hit E. Just, hit, just select your units and hit the E key, and that will automatically make everyone retreat back to the retreat flag and they'll, they'll get a little movement bonus, and they won't take extra damage, so they'll just get the heck out of there as fast as they can. Uh, both sides have a palace, and Puxy has two repair facilities, so he, I think he's definitely going to be using retreat a fair amount. He's going to try and make sure he loses as, as few units as possible. Repair facilities are great because they allow you to, when you retreat a unit, once it's out of con combat for a certain amount of time, it'll get repaired on the board no matter where it is. And it costs only about a fourth of the cost of building an entirely new unit of any kind. So the repair facilities, they only work on, any, on, on a vehicle. They don't work on any kind of infantry. Infantry heal automatically, and there's, there's no cost for that. But you do need repair facilities to repair vehicles. And if you set your retreat values, uh, the default retreat values on light vehicles to a certain percentage, like 50% or something, then you can just send them all in to attack just for, you know, forget about them at that point. And when any one of them gets hurt, they'll immediately move back to the retreat flag, and then after a few seconds, they'll start to be repaired. Then later on, you can bring them back in. So using the repair facilities combined with automatic retreat is a fantastic way to avoid, you know, having to micro anybody too much. It's a very intelligent way to play. Unfortunately, the units that that uh, Puxy just sent in, they're not on any kind of a retreat, uh, automatic retreat. He just manually uh, backed them up a little bit there, but if they were on automatic retreat, they would have started to back up a little bit, and he wouldn't have taken as many losses. He would have taken a little damage, lost a little money, and he would have caused some losses on the other side, but he wouldn't have, you know, it definitely would have been more efficient. So, so we'll see how it goes. He, he does have the repair facilities. He's got a massive amount of heavy vehicles, and here comes the Puxy Rush. This is just what I'm going to call it from now on because, like I said, Puxy loves to save massive amounts of money and then throw down a massive amount of cues. Look at all that production. Look at how 
Every one of those combat tanks is worth 300. Every siege tank is 600. Every rocket launcher is 450. So he just spent and produced, you know, thousands of credits right there all at once. And they were, they were all just, you know, he was saving up that money just to do it that one time. He really likes to just put out a massive force at once. And uh, as long as it works for him, you know, it's no, no problem as long as you win the game. So here's a little scouting action, I think, a little harass that, that got handled pretty quickly by Gavin. Gavin pumping out some infantry, which I always like to see. I don't ever want anyone to underestimate infantry. They are excellent at resolving many particular kinds of situations. They're great at taking down tanks, great at taking down any unit that doesn't fire that fast. Um, main weakness, excuse me, main weakness for tanks, for, uh, sorry, I, I, just, I just noticed him pumping out all these tanks and a Freudian slip just made me say tank. But main weakness is rocket launchers and boom, all the infantry go bye-bye. So that's a lot of, a lot of rocket launchers. Um, he, he, sh he needs to stay in formation and make sure that his tanks stay at the front. He doesn't want those rocket launchers to take too much damage because they'll get shot up pretty quickly. But that'll kind of happen automatically over time too. Uh, everything will just sort of work itself out that way because rocket launchers have a longer range. So they'll just tend to be in the back of the formation after a while. All these other short range units will move up. Oh, there's a massive flak strike flank coming up there too to harass the harvesting operation at the same time as he's making a main push down the center. So Gavin is wisely putting cues for new infantry production way back here to make sure that he does not send them in piecemeal to die one at a time. So he's building up a, a little retaliatory force. He should also be making some light vehicles. That would be really, really cool if he just pumped out a bunch of trikes or something over here because that way he could actually flank the rocket launchers in this force, while everyone was concerned with the front line and all the tanks were locked into combat, he could send a bunch of light vehicles around the back and attack the rocket launchers to do a lot of damage to them because they'll just, they'll very quickly run inside their range. They'll be able to get a lot of shots off and rocket launchers take very little damage. They just don't take much at all. So here comes that infantry force and unfortunately they are not going to do well. They're not going to close the range against those rocket launchers before they take tremendous damage. So we'll see if they even get there. doesn't even look like they're going in the right place. I'm not sure what's up with that. The sandstorm, as it stands, um, you know, these sandstorms coming in might be uh, limiting some visibility for some players. Gavin still has his radar outpost right there, though, so that should have restored his sight. I'm not sure where these infantry are going. I, I don't really know. But... Uh, Gavin did eventually queue up a whole pile of light vehicles. All right, and here I am back. And um, sorry about that. I just had a little hiccup with my recording software, but I'm still watching the same game. The um, all right, so he did eventually. Gavin did eventually queue up a bunch of light vehicles, but unfortunately, that was much too late to uh, handle any of the main attack that was going on. Now, Gavin did did make a lot of rocket launchers, but as he's finding out, they don't do a tremendous amount of damage to tanks. Uh, they don't hit them all that often. And they, I mean, you see all these rockets landing on top of the tanks. They're just not getting hit a lot. It almost looks like he's kiting. He kind of is. He's, I mean, if, if you're familiar with StarCraft play, when he's just he's just running in and then taking a couple of shots and then trying to move away, <laughs> I think that's what he's doing. But I think he's forgetting that when you do that, you make the enemy automatically track you. You know, when you give move orders, enemy bullets automatically follow you. And uh, they also do much extra damage, so you got to be very careful with, with you know, kiting-type situations. You really can't do that in this game, although it, it was fun to watch him try. So he's uh, there's a big rocket launcher battle going on right here. We'll see who survives. Uh, some reinforcements coming in right on top of him. Um, not going to help with that little fight there, but I, I don't think Gavin's got much of a chance. He really doesn't have... Uh, he's still got a lot of harvesters. And he was spending a lot more time paying attention to them this game. But you can see he doesn't really have any production facilities. He doesn't have anything to build from. So he's just got a whole ton of, of, of money-producing buildings. Just a huge economy. But he has nothing to, to build from anymore. So, so that is it. Um, Gavin basically calls GG. He, he does call GG. And uh, good job, Puxy, on basically cleaning him up. Gavin with a very standard build order. But yeah, this is this is standard. This is basic Puxy attack right here. Like I say, this is the Puxy rush. All of a sudden, we have so many rocket launchers because he knows that all he needs to do is clean up enemy buildings. So the rocket launchers are definitely going to just just wreck everything. Uh, and uh, 
Gavin is left. He is GG'd out. And uh, Puxy is, is just, all he needs to do is issue, yep, one basic attack move order into all these buildings, and you will see them all evaporate very, very quickly. There they go. Boom, boom. So Puxy victorious. And uh, again, this is Jesse for, this is Jesse, a.k.a. Dragbolt for Dune 2 The Golden Path. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned a little bit, and uh, we'll see you again. Thanks. Take care.